Hey everybody, how is it going? Tony Neely here, um, a canine cognitive specialist and dog educator. So um, for those that are tuning in right now or for those that um, are seeing a live recording of this uh, live feed, today's going to be an interesting live feed. I don't do live feeds very often, very seldomly, but I met a new friend, a, a really great guy who specializes in canines and behavior and I just, we uh, did a live feed with him and it was just amazing. We just got really deep dab into the rabbit hole and almost talked for two hours, but it was a lot of great information um, as people were um, tuning in and listening to us kind of, you know, banter back and forth about our philosophies and kind of the current state of the dog training industry. But we're going to have Sasha Reese, who's going to be on with us live, and we're going to be kind of going back and forth, just talking about canine behavior and dog ownership, and also uh, just steering away from traditional dog training in a sense, and finding that so much more helpful for dogs and their mental well-being. So hopefully we'll have Sasha Reese um, logging in here soon. He's supposed to be joining us soon. And um, let's see, here he is. So... Let's uh, see if we can have uh, da, 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 da. move box. So I'm not sure how to. Oh, here we go. Your request. Go live with shortly here. Here we go. Hey, Sasha. How Everything are you doing? works. Hi. Hello. Yeah. How are you? is working good and smooth that's awesome so I, I so you. sasha i mean i've been <laughs> ever since our last conversation um i've been like a kid with butterflies just waiting for this opportunity to talk to you again because um our conversation was just so damn good last time and we really realized how similar we are into our approach with um working with clients and working with their dogs and kind of stirring away a little bit from the traditional dog training sense where it's always about control and management but today man i just want to focus on you it's your time to shine and i'm just i just can't wait to hear what you have to share on your insights and your journey and and working with canines <clears throat> so for those that may have not have seen our last live feed and are just meeting you now um why don't we why don't we briefly go into how you ended up getting into this field um and then we'll uh, we'll get this party started and start going into all the amazing um uh, approaches that you have and, and your your take on the dog training industry as well okay first thank you thank you so much for having me uh, back I, <laughs> I i and i also i was thinking so much about what we touched based uh, last time and in our private conversations and thank you so much for this opportunity as well and i just really hope that we're gonna take this forward and keep keep digging deeper into a rabbit hole about these conversations <laughs> okay so when it comes to dogs like Many of us, I guess, I dedicated life to, uh, you know, serving the dogs because uh, that was my little, uh, they were my little uh, saviors. No, no, it's not a quote unquote because literally when I was a young boy, um, like around maybe 15, 16, a teenage age, no, no, even, even less, maybe 12 years old, mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was really having a lot of suicidal thoughts, right? Right. And uh, I, I just didn't fit the society. I didn't fit my family. And it was like really bothering me a lot. And I said like, this doesn't make any sense. So I should maybe start thinking about unfortunate um, events. And then one thought was crossing my mind. I was thinking like, if something happens to me, who going to take care about my dog? Because I really had a great connection with the dog I had at the time, a little Bobby, little some, uh, my grandmother had him in, 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 in her yard. And I was thinking, I have such a nice relationship. She might be missing me and, uh, and no one would have to care about her the way I did. So I said, and that was the last time I had those thoughts cross my mind. And slowly, somehow my life turned to event in serving the canines. I didn't, uh, 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 come up to a later realization that for that particular thought that crossed my mind at that early age, 
I gravitated the entire my life dedicated to, you know, saying thank you for that. Because if they wouldn't be for dogs, it wouldn't be for me today. And all the events, including my kids and everything that came out from that, uh, you know, life that unfolded after that. Right. Um, so uh, <clears throat> my mom was uh, like, um, she was working with an animal. She was, uh, her uncle was a very famous uh, breeder of some, I don't know, chickens he had amazing like million chicken farms and things like that so i was kind uh, of set to go that direction you know inherit all of that take care about his business move it forward uh, but somehow you, you, didn't, you didn't want to you didn't want to get into the chicken industry huh yeah can you imagine like the chicken industry that was how it went and he yeah. was very disappointed when i told him like i don't see chickens as my life i i like dogs and then he yeah. said like uh, oh that that's 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 scary but then then he encouraged me to do and that's how i ended up in the grooming academy in budapest in hungary uh oh. because i understood uh, i was uh, you know uh, going to as well like i don't know how did i ended up in the local veterinarian hospital when i was 16 years old wanting to help you know like in, uh, do something whatever just right. to be to see the field and then uh, later on, I embarked um, uh, veterinarian studies. I was uh, 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 I finished the high school veterinarian, like a veterinarian technician. Mm -hmm. I guess that's how you call it here, right? Yeah. And then I then I also then I, then I also um, enrolled the veterinarian university. But that that then then my mind started to shift because then I uh, then I started to learn about uh, uh, deeper, you know, this mainstream. Uh, connection the world has with the animals mm -hmm. and then I was uh, I couldn't sign up for the industrial farming of animals and then I actually saw that that was what was bothering me with the chicken industry of my of my uncle the way those ducks and chickens and everything was handled in those farms and somehow my I, I said like oh my god now now I need to do uh, now I need to study university in order to approve all of that Right to agree to all of that. And so, the, so the veterinarian industry. So, so when you're going to veterinarian school, which is a very respectable profession, I mean, I, I find it super interesting that you have this wonderful opportunity to be a veterinarian and help a lot of animals with their health. But the veterinarians take on the industry and how you're supposed to be doing things, like their protocols for the industry you just couldn't agree with. It just didn't sit right with you. There. Because at one point, veterinarian industry is very much connected to a public health. And when it comes to a public health, then you don't think about the uh, animal as, oh, they, you don't care about an animal when the public health is an issue. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with that. I just don't want to be part of it. That I need to, you know, that you need to learn about what do you do to farm of the chicken when something happens and the way you are doing it. And it's not right. something that I would, or or not only not only animals. Uh, look at the uh, not only chickens. Look at the pigs, mm -hmm. the way they are treated through the farming. It's like it, it, I I don't know. Can can we call it inhumane? It's completely it, it, like I don't know where that comes from, and all of that is taught in the veterinary industry because actually it's all for the animal safety that you create those pigs in one little crate for the rest of their lives so they don't get injured by each other or injure themselves and that's it and that's what you learn and the entire school is telling you why that is good and why that's for the sake of the animal health and then you pull it that whatever whatever is going there i i just couldn't i just couldn't read those texts and I don't want to brainwash myself to agree to that. I can only imagine, too, because, you know, the thing is, is, you know, when somebody goes into veterinarian profession, you would think that anyone wanting to go into the veterinarian profession has a natural love for animals, right? And so I wonder how, I mean, I wonder how conflicting that is for most people that say, oh, my gosh, I love animals. I want to be in veterinarian medicine. And then they go into veterinarian medicine, and then they realize this doesn't doesn't seem like a group that's really into loving animals. It really seems like a group that's just all about industry standards and, and, and upholding those. So that had to been such a shock to you. Yeah, it was. It was a shock to me. And I, I, I just, um, I, I was a nerd through my life. And I know that when I really pick up the topic, I don't let it go until I do not, un, uh, you know, uncover the, the hidden rock anywhere. 
so I knew that if I would let myself go through that uh, and uh, let myself be to that environment, I would be kind of like completely lost in what, what, what my real feelings towards animals are. And you know, that's very interestingly, you said uh, everyone that, that starts that field is like a love for an animal on, on the first side. That's why you turn to, to, to become like that. Mm. But then when you see the protocols in place, you see a lot of things that conflict with an animal health and longevity and well-being. Because also, also the question becomes, especially when it comes to dogs, right? Mm -hmm. The dogs are lost animal in between animals that you can eat, that you should eat, animals that are interested to a zoology. The, the dog is not enough wild for the zoologist, but then it's not enough uh, able to be eaten for anyone, anyone else's. So who study dogs? Where do you actually study dogs? If you go to the veterinarian university, you learn about the dogs as a part of the learning about every single other animal. But then uh, when, when it comes to a psychology, that how you observe the dog, when the, every single dog that you have an access to is already influenced by the behavior of the humans, the dogs live next by. So is, and then when you read, when, when you tell something, and especially probably you can see that too, when you, when you write your post about something that you observed, then you will have all of these comments telling you it's not how it is because my dog is not doing that. And then mm -hmm. all of those, uh, how do we come to the root of what the really dog is? And where do you study a dog without a human influence? How do you approach the dog that it's not changed by the human interference? And that's what I was interested in. And uh, I, those answers you don't find in the veterinarian study. That is so, so keen because I don't think a lot of people know that. I mean, you, you know, when I, uh, when I met my mentor, as I mentioned before, he was an applied animal behaviorist uh, with a PhD in comparative psychology. And when he was mentoring me about really how to care for dogs and, and what, the, what the dog training industry doesn't realize about dogs, I realized, man, you know, I really, I'm a, I'm, I really want to be more of a behaviorist. And I remember that when I was um, kind of going in the industry and I was kind of referring to myself as a behaviorist, other dog trainers or other people jump in and goes, well, what makes you a behaviorist? You don't have a PhD. You need to go to a university to be a behaviorist. And I thought, wow, that seems like it's really, really important. So I did uh, talk to my mentor and told him, hey, you know, I'm going to go back to school. And my mentor says, oh, really? Well, that's really good. I'm proud of you. What are you going to go back to school for? And I said, I want to be an applied animal behaviorist like you, and I want to have PhD. And you would think that, that my mentor would say, "I yes, that's exactly what you should do. But the thing that really confused me was my mentor said, no, no, don't do that. It's going to ruin you. Yeah. And I said, why would my mentor tell me that? And he said, you don't understand applied animal behaviors he says you're going to go there for eight to ten years because that's how long it takes but it's not going to be about dogs yep it's, it's not, not going to be about, it's be about dogs it's going to be about all kinds of things biology he says there's very little that has to do with dogs your psychology makeup or even how to how to alter the behavior and he said so you're just going to have this plaque and i said yeah but there's a lot of applied animal behaviors that do dogs that will that help dogs i see them advertising their websites and he goes tony those applied animal behaviorists that are in the dog training industry are unemployed animal behaviorists. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Getting into the dog, dog training. Yeah. Because applied animal behaviorists, they don't typically deal with just dogs. They're more consultants for zoology, zoos, and, you know, and protocols. And there, there, there is a perfect way how that, how that field is used. The moment you sell that, uh, the, the moment you tell that, uh, uh, applied animal behaviorism would be used in the zoos, then where that fits that animal dignity and how do, how you can learn something to that will teach you about animals and animal dignity, the way they, they interact with the environment, what real environment is, and then mm -hmm. you go create something for the zoo. You should be first to fight against the zoos, not to go be employed by them. Yeah. So, and yeah. that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. All of the, and everyone need to pay the bill and need to, need to live the life. And now there are so the I had, I, uh, when I was uh, interviewing someone to kind of find an assistant or uh, in that way, I, I had an, uh, one, one interview the, with a guy that was uh, actually exactly like almost a PhD or close by something like that, re making his, his, his assignments towards that. 
and then uh, we were talking about uh, we were talking about uh, background knowledge and everything and then he said i i i, I was i was working in the in the sea world and I said, oh it's the like, world how? okay yeah i said like how do you work in that environment and then to expect that actually all of that love for animals will be used in that in that setting how, as how in that happens entertainment they're like dancing monkeys and they're not really treated how and they keep them hungry because you have to keep those animals hungry it's like telling your kid you, you know, you're not getting good grades so we're holding back your food that's exactly that's exactly you know when you go to the zoo and then you see elephant behave so nicely doesn't do nothing goes left right sleeps things like that and i remember it was like that was impacting my 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 zoo you know uh, uh, perception uh, when i i saw like how is he so how is he so quiet like i i like he he looks like I don't see happy because they cry a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. But okay, he. But on the end, that animal can just ruin, destroy everything there because it has such a big power. And yet they said no, they don't do that because they're hungry. And then you know the Ringling Brothers and all of those things, is that how the mankind teaches uh, treats animals, and that what unfortunately looks like a lot of behaviorists will support because that why is that why they went to school yeah to learn how to manipulate animals with starvation and food you know um and then this was... that, that's what that's what oftentimes the industry of the dog training is doing as well blackmailing starving do this do that yeah. come here come there you know uh, uh yeah because the thing is is you know when, in the veterinary medicine especially when you're when science diet as we know kind of funds that um and in science diet they, they in the back of the bags they have these feeding schedules and then when you talk to a lot of food-based trainers they always tell you you need to have a feeding schedule and then when i was talking uh over with my mentor one of the things he was saying was animals are fully capable of regulating their own food you don't have to put them on a feeding schedule and, and then now, now you now you touch a real point of the rabbit hole you know, when, when all of those recipes for the, for the dog food are created by the veterinarians that are schooled for to do that, right? And yet yeah. those foods are full of the things that no one would put in the, you know, it's not a human grade food. Everything that goes in a, in a dog food that's in a kibbles, it's, you can, you can, me, we can't eat, right? And then suddenly I was doing some show to answering some questions on my, on my, to my Serbian community. And I was doing a, a big research and I was shocked when they said like, okay, uh, you know, FDA somewhere around uh, 2008, FDA warned the um, uh, public, okay, that there is a, when, when, you, when you put like a meal meat on the, on the, on the label, they said uh, like, uh, though, that meal meat, does, you don't need to list animals that you actually put in the food. And the, it turned around to be the, the, why the warning was issued, because actually uh, you would find a lot of euthanized dogs and cats in the kibbles inside. So the FDA was warning people that actually uh, it might be something uh, warning there that actually euthanized animals would be used for the dog food. But how about uh, taking a euthanasia injections? are actually also be found in the dog food, whatever is used to, you know, cause that cardiac, cardiac arrest right. to, to make, a dog, uh, make a dog or cat die or any other animal. So they said, like, there might be a traceable, a significant amount of lethal injections found in the dog food because meal meat might include euthanized dogs and cats. All of that is supported and done by veterinarians because they said in the industry, in order to create an, a formula for the dog food, you need to have an, a veterinarian school. Mm -hmm. How do you put a euthanized cat and dog inside the dog food? That's gross. And you know what? I was, I was witnessing that because my uncle had this, uh, that was my granddad. I don't know how to, uncle of my mom. So it was my yeah. granddad. So. And he was uh, one of one part of that big conglomerate because he that those was like we were farms with a million chickens and he had all production from the egg till everything. So there was a part of the company that was producing chickens for the for the laying eggs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, the, the the laying eggs. And when you produce those chicken 
when the chicken were born, the the female chicken is uh, like a, a like a red color, uh -huh. and the little little male chicken is a white color. So you immediately know which one is which one is female, which one is male, uh -huh. and the females are going to the farms. What happens to a little males? You know what happens to them? They, they, they are, go to Buffalo Wild Wings. They are grounded. <laughs> oh. They are grind alive into a chicken paste. Oh man! And then it, it's sent to a it's sent to a dog food factory to make a, maybe it's it's not. He said like, I'm not even sure. He told me I'm not even sure that the paste that we make out of these babies is actually not trying to be a food for these sisters that actually gonna lay the eggs oh because it can man, be, it so can eating be, themselves it's like cannibalism because it's a cannibalism because it can be it can be a it can be a, a it's called like a meat paste or a, what a protein paste it can be yeah because that that chicken is grounded alive and then you know what's also the most uh, um the most common um, um the most common problem of the egg farming when you put them in the crates mm -hmm. It's uh -huh. a cannibalism because those chicken would uh, kill each other and eat each other. And they said like, it might be a reason because they are maybe fed with their own brothers. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, so, I mean, that's enough to get anybody to run the other direction. So then how did you get into dogs? I mean, how did dogs just, well, I know that you, you've always loved dogs. So what did you go from there? Once you realized, okay, okay. I love animals, but this is not what I want to do with animals. I don't want to be in the veterinarian industry. Yeah. And then so then like, what happened after that? Yeah, so I, I, I mentioned I went to veterinary. I, I, so, I, okay, this is what happened. Yeah. I was, while I was in that, in that veterinarian uh, clinic, you know, working there, practicing, and, you know, I would go to the school in the afternoon, and, and in the morning I would be in the clinic, or I would go in a school in the morning, then in the afternoon I would be. So I, I spent the entire my days there, like for long, maybe 10 years. So I have a 10 years of real on the ground veterinarian experience. It wasn't a small animal clinic, one in a Serbia the, at that time that was uh, rarely, rarely uh, existing in, in a country because mm -hmm. also the veterinarians at that time were not interested in the dogs. They mm -hmm. said like, oh my God, like dog is gonna be okay, right? Mm -hmm. All time. You don't, you don't, you don't go and um, kind of, um, you know, give a dog any treatment because dogs will be good dogs will be okay couple of days and they're gonna be okay and in Serbia you didn't have any veterinarian that was specialized in the dogs or small animals and you cannot learn only dogs and only small animals through the university you're working everything and then maybe the specialization PhDs and quite interest after all of that gonna give you a track to get yourself up and running most uh -huh. and I was I was answering the phone phones, right? That was my, my job. Answer the phones and direct the phones as one of many tasks. And there was, a, there was an interesting uh, story that I, uh, I, I find uh, getting calls about, uh, can you groom my dog? Can you groom my dog? Is there anything to groom? The, can you groom the dog? Can you groom the dog? My dog is... And there was a one lady in my town that was actually I, I was referring to. Right. And then she was the only one. And then... Uh, the, her name was Maria, right? And that was very interesting. Uh, big tribute to her. She's not anymore with us because at that time I was 16. Now I'm 50. She was already yeah. old. But yeah. I was referring everything to her. And on the end, uh, my 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 the the my mentor actually the doctor that was working there in the clinic. She said, like, take those dogs and just groom them because we cannot. Die. She don't have time. The people are calling all the time. Just can you just? And I said, but I don't know how to do that. And then next, next thing you know, there was uh, some show, like a dog show that uh, I was sent to check the rabies shots uh -huh. because you cannot enter the, the show ground if you don't have a uh, rabies shots. And then I was checking the rabies shots after I was done. I was circling around, looking at the dog shows. It was amazing. I liked the experience. And then at one point, I, I saw the girl grooming dogs, you know, cocker spaniels. She was pulling the plucking the coat, doing things. And she's like, how can I learn this? She can, I, I don't have time for that. Call me on Monday. And she gave me a call and I called on Monday and I called the school on Thursday, I was there and the rest is a history. So that's was how I entered the, groom, uh, the grooming world. That's how I en ended the world of the canines professionally. 
And then I told you the story that will take me towards the direction of understanding the dog's behavior is was this incident that happened on the table uh, because the standard industry standard is a safety loop for the for the grooming on the grooming and the grooming arms on the in the in the grooming industry, uh -huh. you know. And then uh, that that's what you do. You put the dog on the table and you put a safety loop over them. Yes. Yeah, and I can and just before it maybe it's another audience. I'll just tell the story fast again because yeah. it's a significant impact to my life. Uh, I had this beautiful Terra Nova getting ready for the show. And uh, he was he was there, groomed by one of the best in the salon. And every one of us, the students were just looking around. You you were not supposed to touch the show dog when they come. And I was just maybe maybe second week in a program or something like that. So I was a really newbie. And the dog was everything is by protocol. You put the dog on a table, you put a safety loop, and that's it. But the dog was very huge, and the table was very huge. But the dog was you know staying there and we, they bait the dog, they put him back, safety protocol, everything is in place. And the dog, as it stays, just slips from the side of the table, but with one leg, loses the balance and falls off and pulls, pulls the leash. The table was very heavy, so the table didn't, 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 didn't turn. So he was hanging. Yeah. Sorry? So he was hanging himself? He was hanging himself up. And then the, I, I, and as I told you last time, and I'm telling the story now again, I can still, like almost 40 years later, I can still hear the neck crack. Yeah. Oh, man. The, the dog was just laying there. And then I said like, and then that was, a, that was a time when I said, I dedicated myself, I said, I will never use a safety loop on my dogs. I will never use a safety loop on my dogs that I will be grooming. And I was talking to the teacher, she said, it's a safety issue. He said, but it's a safety issue. You see how safety issue is. If that dog wouldn't have a safety loop over his neck and he sleeps over the dog, maximum he can go is maybe break his leg, be uncomfortable for a couple of days, but he, be, he wouldn't die. Yeah. And if you yeah. teach dogs, there must be a way. If we can teach elephants to do and ride the bicycle in the circus, then we can also find a way to make a dog's comfortable on the table, to enjoy the grooming process, to without, love it. Without using that. Without safety. using the safety loop. And I said, I'll find a way to make the dogs happy on the table, not to resist, not to be, uh, not to be forced to love something that we want to have. And then I said, like, I find a way. And that's how I started. I couldn't, um, I couldn't go deep because then now, as that time, you know, we didn't have internet. So I was, you know, reading a lot of books about a wolf, about how the dog became a dog. And that's very also, you, you must, you probably have the same question to answer is like uh, how the evolution of the dog pro actually happened. It's unsolved puzzle because you have a, you have a wolf, a gray wolf that no one uh, disagree. It's a beginning of the chain of the evolution that happens to dogs, but every single experiment. And I was a, I was observing a couple of them where you take a dog, where, where you take a wolf from the wild, no matter is it one day, three days, every single, every single institution tried a different, uh, different level, different, uh, different old, uh, age of the, those little wolf puppies. Mm -hmm. You take them in your home, you try to domesticate them. The moment they become um, sexually, uh, how can I say, mature. like a six months, seven months, like sexually mature, Mm -hmm. They start to attack, they start to fight, they start to protect. So it's not, you cannot domesticate the wolf. Mm -hmm. the, become, mm -hmm. the question becomes like, how do you really, how this chain of the evolution of the, the vo dogs, uh, wolf becoming dogs happen? Who came first? Who approached first and why? Mm -hmm. How happened that the most aggressive creature on the planet would be the first domesticated animal because we domesticated cows maybe thousands years later after we domesticated dogs the dog the dog you, we must put ourselves in the in the shoe of the man that was walking this planet 10 or 15 or 100,000 years ago probably hunting the same territory that was hunt uh, that was hunted by the mm. wolf mm. trying to do the same lifestyle probably as a wolf how happened that the two competitors at one place create a pact rather than killing each other? So that's who, who, who approached first, how that happened and why. 
becomes a mystery to this day. A lot of time, you know, and the thing is, is the best, the best, um, the best guest so far, and it's already, it's already been witnessed in other species, yet we don't know still with the dog, but it has been done with other species, is that eventually they became a symbiotic relationship and cooperative with one another to help each other hunt. Just like, just like, right, just like the crows, right? Um, the crows also, the crows and the wolves actually help each other as well. And so then eventually they created a symbiotic relationship and then man started using dogs and started breeding for their certain traits and stuff. I mean, that's all theory, but I mean, that's kind of where I, I think the best guess would be. No, no, I get that, but why, the, why, we, could, why we cannot mimic that as well? We have a gray wolf out there. Why, why you can start to circle again? Why you can initiate the evolution again? Why none of experiments try to do that, domesticate the, the wolf or try to make a wolf be a, uh, great as a puppy or great as a dog without neutering and spaying them, how that never reached the point of, yeah, we can have this wolf and slowly get him into a I possibility mean, it's not, of... It's not like they had pinch collars and they were already doing training back then. Oh, let's get this wolf and let's start clicker training him. And yeah, that yeah, way yeah. he can help us, right? Yeah. Somehow, somehow a different kind of relationship for him. You had, you had a wonderful point and you put in a wonderful word called initially it become a symbiotic, uh, a, uh, it was not initially, I, I wanted to put initially, but I said, uh, on, uh, it be, somehow it became a symbiotic relationship. But mm -hmm. what, what made it possible to become a, who made the first move towards whom? That's the question we need to answer. And you have a scientist that, tell, that tells that the dog, like a wolf made a first move towards humans. And that's how the dogs are actually Thinking, uh, how can you say, if you think that you can think be, uh, before a dog, then you really need to, uh, then you are not average human because the humans tend not to think in a present moment. We are caught in what happened or what will be and we lose a presence in the moment. What you really need if you want to properly communicate with your dog. So uh, not you, anyone, me yeah. included, because when I it say you, me. I don't, I don't <laughs> say you. Right, yeah. And then on the other side, on the other side, uh, but if you follow some scientists, let's say Ray Copping, Coppinger, I don't know how you, okay, Ray Coppinger was one of the biggest influence when it comes to a, a dog evolution to me, uh, where he actually, where, he, where his theory is actually that the dogs, the wolves approached first. Uh -huh. And then the wolf, and that, that was like maybe peri period of do, uh, adaptation of the wolves to a human life of 5,000 years. Right. And then just then the people were able to take it from there and move it forward. But that's what actually means that the dogs are always one step ahead of us because that's what, what made them become who they are today. And they can predict our behavior much more than we can predict theirs. Yeah. And, if, and if that initial point is lost or if we don't have an, a, agreement or whoever is training the dog or researching the dog he needs to they need to start with the first point how this happened who approached first and why what was the reason then humans or wolves saw in each other and made the first move and how that happened that something that would you know probably i said if the wolf comes to my doorstep probably you would keep it before you ask him oh can we do something together yeah no, no you yeah how yeah, yeah. that happened and if you don't have consensus like a scientific consensus on that you cannot train dogs differently than you train animals in a circus. it's always going to be by force or some sort of food some sort of motivator until so 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 if somebody so if somebody um so let's say uh, because for those that are just watching you and just meeting you, right? Because we're going into like the history of how dogs even even became in our presence. But um, I want everybody to know how differently you work with animals. So if I was a client and I called you and I said, "Hey, Sasha, I just went to PetSmart, didn't work out for my dog, or I have a puppy and maybe my puppy's not food." Well, what could you? What would you tell me as a client? Because I'm looking for a dog trainer, right? So if I called you and said, Sasha, I'm looking for a dog trainer and I really want to use an e-collar. I see a lot of 
success with that. Or I want to see, I want, I'm looking for a balanced trainer because I want a little of both. Uh, and I'm calling you and I'm not even aware that that's not exactly what you do. How would you tell me or how would you tell the audience right now um, what makes you different than a dog trainer? Like, what do you, what do you do? So first, what we do is actually my, my cup of tea is actually going deep from uh, deep, deeply to understand the moment where you and your dog are at the present time. Mm -hmm. And we are doing one very, uh, very, um, like very comprehensive uh, lab analysis of your dog's physiological body and its state by doing a very, like, uh, very uh, comprehensive, but al also very pragmatic because once you see those lab results, some of them, uh, it's, a, it's a hair tissue mineral analysis, right? So that would be the first. When any of clients approaches, that would be the first thing to see. Like how the environment and how your perception of the dog's life impacts the dog life at this point. Everything you feed them, environment you live in, and interaction you have together will impact the dog's physiology and this little task can show us up to which level your uh, understanding of what's good for dog is actually right. Mm. And it's not only because the HTMA um, code analysis is uh, like present on the, uh, in the world, but we have uh, my mentor from Serbia is one of the leading experts in the world when it, when it comes to the reading report. Because, you know, everyone can do the test, but not everyone can see the report and pull out what needed to be pulled out from the report in one. So then we, then we analyze that. And then you will see, oftentimes, that the mineral ratios of the, of the minerals that already created tissues of your dog's body mm -hmm. are usually, and, and I must say this, 99% of the tests we do in the ratios we look for are off mm -hmm. and then no matter how dogs are old or how old they are whatever the what comes to be the most interesting uh, connection would be a level of the uh, activity of the adrenaline gland mm -hmm. and the level of the t activity of the thyroid gland mm -hmm. and that you can see through the ratios of the calcium magnesium and other elements within the tissue so mm -hmm. that would be the first thing to see where your dog stands at this point within his body physically Literally. the next thing what we do is i i have another another test that we perform with our clients and that's how do you understand your dog how do you interact and we have a test that you take and then that's a human dog interaction test mm -hmm. when we combine these two then we see actually how your understanding of the dog life everything you read about the dogs the way you feed your dog the way you interact your dog actually impacts the dog life mm -hmm. And the dog's physiology, because it's already changing by what you think it's right. Either food or behavior or interaction, training, whatever you choose, everything has its effect. And once we combine those two things, what we come up with is a protocol. And the protocol is very comprehensive. And we come to start working on how you should behave, how we, how which kind of environment the humans should create around the dog with the food, our behavior, and the environmental changes, either in, in between the house or if we are living in a very polluted area, whatever, sometimes pollutants are getting into the dog's body uh, and the pollutants itself are creating incapability of dog to perform properly. Because you just happen to live in downtown New York that's filthy and terribly dirty, and every single time you take your dog in a walk, the dogs come home full of the heavy metals and everything on his, on his coat. And now you're just, you know, taking him and you don't have time to wash it or brush it or do whatever you want to take that off. And then the next thing, the dog is chewing a little bit of, of, his, of his coat. And now the heavy metals are not anymore on the coat. Now the heavy metals are in the coat. Mm. But the heavy metals can be stored in the brain affecting possibility of dog to act accordingly to what you want them to do. So now, in order for you to get closer to the dog, you need to clean your dog off with the heavy metals. Otherwise, he won't be able to perform anything you put him in these situations in because physiologically his brain is not able to, 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 to respond because it's full of the heavy metals getting your dog because you just leave downtown some very polluted city. 
So all of that is something that we take into consideration when I create the protocols for the clients that are very specific and very custom and tailored made for where you live, the way you interact with the dog, your perception of the dog life and well-being. And that's how we, that's what I, what I, what, what we do. And you will see slowly maybe changing the diet, doing a depollution, taking off the heavy metals from the brain or the body, uh, trying to adjust the protocols uh, based on the behavior, because the behavior interaction with the humans and with the dogs, it's not only uh, uh, going to come from how do I train my dog, but how do I create environment in which the dog respond to be what we assume is acceptable and desirable behavior. And that's how the symptoms of the undesirable and unacceptable behavior disappear because what need to change because the you know that uh, probably i guess because i know you know mm -hmm. that the dog's behavior is only way they can communicate with us they don't talk our language yeah so if they need to tell us something bothers them something is not right they don't feel safe they are scared they are threatened they feel uncertain in the environment they live they're gonna do something pull on the leash be aggressive pee the house do something. They're going to do something physically or they even have to resist to, to try to communicate Whatever. with you that something's not being met. And but you're going to, but you're going to, you're going to, you're going to perceive it as a behavioral issue. Yeah. You're going to come and say behavioral issue. It's not a behavior. It's a communication. It's a language. The way they talk, the way they can talk, the way, and you're going to see that behavior from Chihuahua to the Great Drain and everything in between the same. And it's nothing to do with the breed, it's to do with, as, as we discussed last time, all instincts, survival so instincts. The interesting thing that, that I really like about how you approach working with a client is because um, I know that you're not in the dog training industry, so you may not, well, you may already know this, but you know how when you go to McDonald's, every Big Mac tastes the same. If you buy a Big Mac in California, it's gonna taste just like the Big Mac in New York. It's like a, a set thing, right? And so when a dog trainer works with clients, you have your basic class, your intermediate class, or advanced class, or they're always the same, it's always the same protocol. Like they work with all dogs the same exact way, right? Regardless of, of what's going on. But what I really like what you were just saying is that when you're working with clients, I mean, I. I mean, I would assume this would be kind of expensive, but if you think about it, what you're doing is you're doing an individual behavioral study on that. You're, you're doing a behavioral study on their dog. It, it's, it yeah. starts off as a behavioral study, yeah. not a curriculum. Yeah, it's come because you cannot develop a curriculum if you don't know against what actually you are developing a curriculum for. And I, I must take you away, it's not expensive at all. We, we we can the, if you because the the everything of this uh, the when you take a blood for example from the dog you take mm -hmm. a blood and the blood have very sensitive homeostasis so it tends to very fast gravitate back to whatever whatever was you know uh, challenged or whatever is uh, you know what was pushed out from the from the order so when you take a blood for example now and maybe in two hours the same dog. Uh, the blood results might not be the same. You will see the gravitation, maybe within the range, maybe off the range, mm -hmm. but sometimes also taking a dog to a vet to take a blood test is a stress on its own. And right. if the dog experience stress, mean that the cortisol level in the dog is high, the cortisol level spikes the level of the glucose as well. So the glucose can, uh, can cover, and all of that hormonal interaction can cover or increase and put out from the balance a lot of things that you might think it's a problem, what are actually not a problem because the dog just resisted. And it's not only the dog resisted, everything you resist, it's already a hormonal and a physiological change that forces your body to resist. Mm -hmm. You don't resist just because you want to resist. Every resistance needs to take an action. And an action of resistance means that I'm afraid. I'm not afraid just because I'm afraid. I'm already f afraid because I can feel emotion of fear. An emotion of fear is a creating very sensitive bodily reaction of the hormonal change that happened within the body by interaction of the 
internal glands like that that um, because you know it's happening in, it's happening internally it's not an outward thing it's happening inside the dog's mind and then they're you know it's, it's something it's just it's triggered it's triggered externally and it, the change happened internally and that's what i said like when you take a blood from your dog you can see what you can see if you take a coat because the coat is lifelong like let's say the matrix of uh, let's say three months of how the dog you live, how, how your dog lived in the last three months is actually written in the coat. And if you take the test and you read it properly, then you can know how much, uh, how your interaction as an external force on your dog is changing your dog from within. Gotcha. Yeah, it's really interesting. I um, remember I told you that my mentor always thought I was a pain in the butt because I always think of things as a dog trainer because I've been training for 20, for 20 years before I started getting into more cognitive behavior. And one of the things um, that he had a difficult time with me was always, always, always focusing on the external factors but not internally what's going on with the dog. And he said, you know, Tony, he says, it's really hard to explain this to you because you're a dog trainer. I'm trying to teach you how cognition is different than behavior. Where he says, behaviorism is so old. All the dog trainers are still using behaviorism. He says, that's so old school, that's the 1900s. We don't even do that today. He said, he said, let me just explain it to you. He said, when you see a beer, right? And you're an alcoholic, do you go to the counselor and say, I would never used to be an alcoholic. The beer turned me into an alcohol, you know, into an alcoholic. And I go, right, that makes sense. And he goes, no, it doesn't make sense. The <laughs> beer didn't make you an alcoholic. You already had an addiction to begin with, right? Yeah. When you, he says, when, when, he says, if you cheat on your spouse, right? It wasn't the sexy person that made you cheat on your spouse and you became reactive and couldn't help yourself. You're a cheater already, right? It's something internally that <laughs> needs to function correctly. To, uh, right, so you can't blame everything exterior, and that's what dog trainers do—they work on the exterior. My dog's reactive to other dogs. Well, then we got to work around other dogs. That's just like saying my husband's an alcoholic. Well, we got to fill your fridge full of beer and start redirecting him to not look at the fridge. Yeah, that per perfectly said. Because there, you know, there is there is that internal factor that actually uh, our DNA adjusts to the ou outer world, and that connection in between outer reflex inner and inner reflex outer is very much present in our life as well we just not utilize that because we never live in the present moment and uh, but the dog that oftentimes when i uh, you know the protocol will include like recording the videos and then you sh send me how you do things and then i send you because i i always love so, to... so you do this all this you do all of this remotely then you work with a client just over the internet yeah. so that you don't even have to be there yeah, yeah, no, because everything, everything that one test that that one that one uh, that test that actually goes into a human canine dynamic dynamic evaluation test, mm -hmm. that is a test that's actually very comprehensive. Maybe like uh, up to seven, depend on the depend on the results. Once we get the results from the lab, then we actually uh, create a test on its own. So every test is different. Once we see something in the lab uh, as an outcome, then we want to try to. Uh, for example, you know, the test will be, you know, those uh, books that we read as a kid, if you want a Cinderella to kiss oh. the, this, then oh, go the to the page. adventure books where, yeah, 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 if you want to go down to the right hallway, turn to page 36. If yeah, 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 yeah. Hallway, turn to page 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one. So when we see something in a test, then we actually really know which, which test we're going to perform other because that we call it like a, like a canine har harmony wellness test that's combined of two tests that are going to bring us a very comprehensive um, uh, assessment of why, how your dog is physiologically shaped at the moment, mm -hmm. which environment shaped the dog to become like that, through feed, through behavior and everything. And then how do you and your understanding of the dog life contributed to that? That's kind of completely environmental assessment. And then that blends into this one that becomes like a protocol. And then the protocols uh, are very, uh, uh, very unique because I, 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 there is not as because. Uh, and these pro protocols, these protocols that, so once you get their physiology makeup and you start going, okay, now that we understand this, 
and we understand how your interaction with your dog affects that, we're going to change how you do things or how you interact with your dog. We're going to change those protocols. Um, can you give me an example of, um, and, and, and you don't have to give away too much information that you're, that you're not willing to share because I, I respect your knowledge and I don't want anything for free, you know, but can you give me like a hypothetical protocol that somebody watching learning about you can understand. The reason why I'm saying this is because I work with clients remotely too, because I don't, I don't I'm not, it's nothing about training for me as well. It's, and it's funny because sometimes when I work with clients worldwide, they don't understand. I have an aggression issue, for example, or my dog's reactive when he sees other dogs in a walk. <laughs> How are you going to help me from North Carolina when I live in Australia? Oh. I don't understand. How, how can you help me if you're not even here? So give me an example of, of what a typical protocol would be and how and why that would work. Okay, so the, 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 the first, again, like we are done with the tests, we have our assessments and we know what's, what's to be done, okay? Right. So some of the protocols might include the dietary change, supplementation add-ons, and then detoxification that can be done through, the, uh, the, through some uh, detoxifiers that you can uh, take, uh, like a pills or supplements. Mm -hmm. But some of them need to be a, a prescribed bed that you need to put your dog in the bed, in the mud bed, you know, put them, put some, uh, then, and then we customize the mud based on what actually the problem of your dog is because sometimes we want to avoid that all of those heavy metals will be uh, will be moved out from the body using liver and kidney and what because that that can actually on the other side that can pretty much damage the body so what you want to do is actually pull them out through the skin so some of the protocols would, would use those mud baths and specially designed and custom made uh, fro formulas for the mud baths. Uh, but, and then, so that's why dietary yeah. detoxification. Okay. And then the third one would be uh, assessing the behavioral uh, issue. And that was, you said, okay, now we are in, in the sense of the training, right. but it's nothing to do with the dogs. It's only what changes is the behavior of the client. So I teach you, how to use the four rituals that I find actually gonna trigger and up, uh, overwrite every single behavior issue because through those four rituals, you are actually communicating the essence of the dog-human interaction. And that's a food that brought us together, the way you are feeding your dog, then coming and reuniting from the cave, the way you are entering and going out from the home and how, what you do when you go out and what you do when you come back. And how do you communicate that, pro that, that, that strict leadership role using just the door as, an, uh, as a tool? Mm. So it's not you fixing your dog separation anxiety. Not directly. But not directly because all, all, all this has to do is with the sacred place in your home. That's a cave. That's an entrance into the cave, entrance into the sacred place. And that entrance divides the chaotic world that's outside and the peace that's inside. And then, uh, for example, and then the, 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 that, that's, the, that's the second ritual we go around. And then the walking ritual is actually the most difficult one to, so we actually don't, oftentimes I don't do the walking ritual because there is a lot to be done and uh, the leash pulling or things like that. So I wouldn't bother too much, but what we are giving too much uh, assessment on is the playtime ritual. Because as I said, like, don't be afraid and don't be uh, feeling shame or guilt if you didn't take your dog outside for a walk rather than taking them to a toilet, right? But feel guilty if you didn't play with your dog inside your home at least 10 minutes a day. So the protocols based on the assessments defined are gonna mostly be focused on the playtime the play i will give you the the i will be, give you the exercises that you're going to play with your dog fulfill the playtime ritual through the exercise the way because usually when we say play with your dog what we do is actually we play with them push them pull the things we hide their uh, excitement i you know you you do you bring again excitement high and yeah. then you are stuck you know the, a lot of time you hear those stories like oh my god i was playing with my dog and he just bites me I was doing this with my dog and he never did that, but he just, you know, got, started growling on me because it's a power challenge. It's a way to use it as a power challenge or a way to interact with your dog and slowly 
raise the excitement down. So what we drew through this exercise is that would be the mostly difference to the client's protocol would be how do I interact with my dog during the playtime or the play ritual and I get my dog to purr like a cat. Yeah. To get to, to the point where actually my dog love interacting with me and outcome of that interaction is actually falling asleep. How do you play with your dog to make your dog fall asleep? That's a high end of respect. And also that's a, it's a simultaneous effect because one, you're affecting their physiology through those endorphins of playing with you. Then on top of that, they're getting the experience of how to calm themselves down from that when you're no longer playing, which if you're working with your reactive dog, they don't, this is blowing my mind because I can see where it bleeds off to other things without you having to work on it. So not to interrupt you, but you just got me super excited. So I, I, have, to, I have to say this. A lot of times when people walk their dogs and you say, why are you walking your dog for exercise? Well, dogs don't walk for exercise. <laughs> exercise, they right? don't walk for exercise. So there's only two reasons why your dog's walking. It's either to, to migrate to better territory, better food resources, right? Or it's territory, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But you don't really, if you really want to stimulate your dog and increase that bond, it has to be between you and the dog. That has to happen between you and the dog, not just walking. It's like going to a restaurant with my wife for her anniversary and just going through the act of eating, but we don't have conversation. There you right. go. So then, then the other thing also too is if you're dealing with a reactive dog, they're so there's they, they get reactive, so they're stimulated, but they don't know how to control themselves from that stimulation because they don't have the experience of calming themselves down. But you can work on reactive behavior by doing that protocol because yep. you raise the stimulation and then you say, okay, I don't, I don't want to play anymore. We're done playing. And then they learn how to control the stimulation. Then you raise the stimulation, let's play, have fun. And then later on, you're like, okay, we're done. We're having fun. I'm tired. And then they have to control the stimulus. And that can help for other aspects of their life of controlling themselves. So that's where the physiology changes, right? Yeah, that's exactly where the physiology changes because it depends on the how reactive, because the thyroid gland usually through the test can be hip hyper or hypochiral, so it can go very active or very not active in between mm -hmm. two of those. Both of those uh, sensitive, sensitive changes of the thyroid uh, activity are in, uh, done in, uh, in most cases of course if anyone listens to this and you know want to want to get it so linear of course it's not like that but in most cases is in direct interaction with the with the adrenaline gland that's actually reacts only if the dog is in an environment in which fear must appear and what the dog can fear uncertainty of the tomorrow's food unprotected and uncertain about the environment they gonna they need to control mm -hmm. it's a house so again we are coming to the feeding ritual reuniting and departing ritual and interacting rituals so so if i rituals you, then are these all these rituals you have in place are the rituals that they need to do to maintain that that i like to use the word autonomous i know that we're having difficulty with that word earlier but yeah yeah, yeah. These, these rituals is what maintains i guess the, the balance of the dog so you don't have to worry about controlling and managing and, and behavior. So you don't need to sit down, stay, no, you no, just, no, 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 no. right? Yeah, because th th that's the way how you train your dog in order to, to do something for you, thinking that that's the way you're gonna make yourself leader because the dog gonna listen to you because when you tell him something to do, he gonna do it. What I created protocols and the most likely we are, let's say, create a 50 protocols and in 50 protocols, they are the one game that they need to perform and that's the playtime ritual that need to be done like three times a day maybe five minutes max that's all we go right. but that bond that created through that playtime is actually something that brings dogs and, and clients to get like a dogs and their parents like so close together that they are kind of like amazingly like a, a trustworthy environment to that because and you know what also, and, and and this might be a really this might not be a good word to use but it is it is it is kind of similar if you have a better word um you can you can correct me but it, it you know when people like for example when i have clients they take sticks and they throw sticks for the dogs to chase <laughs> and it creates that stimulation right and then I always tell people, don't, don't play fetch with your dog. And they go, oh, why not? It's for him to get exercise. And I go, no, 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 that's not bonding. 
that's an off-leash chase. It's triggering a, an instinctual thing. Yeah. It's mock hunting. That's why they can't help themselves but chase it and then bring it back to you. Don't work on an off-leash chase. You should be working on an off-leash bond. If you can turn yourself into a stick, throw yourself. Throw yourself. So they can obsess <laughs> over you. Run away over a stick, yeah. Right, run away then. So if, you're, if, you're, if they're engaging and playing with you, the, the toy doesn't become an obsession. No. The chucket doesn't become the obsession. The stick that you, I'm obsessed, I'm obsessed with you because I'm engaging in the play with you. Yeah, and that's all what the dog wants. That's the all, the all, the one. What what we actually turn to be oftentimes is we want the dogs become a center of our universe, and that's a place where they feel unsafe, unprotected, and unworthy, and very undignified. Mm -hmm. What actually happens and should happen are that we become a center of the dog's, dog's universe, but from the very respectful way, and that's, that, then we talk about the orders of harmony, mm -hmm. that we need to respect animals for what the animals are. I need to know all about the dogs in order to provide the right things for the dog, not the things I think the dog needs what the dog really needs, mm. then I have a responsibility to do that. I have, uh, usually the rituals are creating a self-discipline toward owners not to cross the line of emotional entanglement with their dogs, treating dogs like a humans and disrespecting, disrespecting them at that end, and then provide to the dogs the right for the dignified life and when the time comes to dignify death. And those are times, those are things that we practice bond and we do understand like what the dog's really needs are. And we are currently, I have a very, very uh, small, but very, I'm very proud of my institute that's called like Pure Love and Harmony Institute. And I was very- Is there, and is, is that a, and I want to continue our conversation. So I'm, 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 I'm going to say something because I want people to know how to get a hold of you, but it doesn't mean that we're going to stop talking. Um, okay. For somebody that's that's listening right now and they're like, wow, this is some stuff I haven't heard before. Where can they get more information about you? Where, 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 like, where do I go to, to get a hold of you? So you go to my Instagram accounts. That's easier. Sasha Reese, R-I-E-S-S, -E -S, mm -hmm. right? And then you have a link tree where you have a lot of links to follow. Or our webpage is pureloveandharmony.com. Okay. And pureloveandharmony.com, just as it goes, pureloveandharmony.com. And then uh, you can find a lot of this, what I'm talking about now there. But also one, one little thing, one, one, uh, uh, our institute, my everything that we do actually requires a new science of the human canine interaction. Mm. And that is why I formed the Pure Love and Harmony Institute. That's actually on the webpage you have, the, uh, the webpage for that institute is my myplh.com so myplh.com it's our institute and you have a lot of studies that we perform or performed when it comes to human canine interaction and at the moment we have two studies going on one is a behavioral study that actually reveals much in depth this what i said like how the coat tissue analysis changes over time because it's not only to do it now and I give you the protocol and then you do what's in a protocol. We need to keep maintaining it. So we need to check it in three months and then three months and three months. So four times a year, we check, we have a different levels of the membership sites and things like that. So you can choose as you go, the pace you can pay, everything. We, we, try, we try to work so with- So once you're working with your clients, then there's like this membership. So it's like periodic checkups, like going to the doctors. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So you know what to, you, you, you always adjust the protocols. You always adjust the protocols. We have a, we have, of, of course, that the protocols in the spring and in winter in California and in Miami wouldn't be the same. Or the winter in New York and or, in, or in Nebraska wouldn't be the so, same. So like a lot of times when people go to dog training, the dog trainer says you have to do this every single time for the rest of your dog's life. <laughs> but what happens if your dog can't run for the rest of his life? So. <laughs> So you also, I'm assuming that as you're working with your clients and, and four times a year they're doing these checkups, age plays a factor. So you got to change the protocols based on their age, right? Yeah, everything. The change, for example, uh, the change would place the factor. And then you say, okay, I, I, now, I, I now need to go like uh, 
10 days to some trip. I don't know what is going to happen. We change the protocol. What, who going to work with the dog? Who stays with the dog? How do you go? How do you come back? What's going on? So it's kind of like a very, very uh, custom made. What I wanted to come to the point is really customized, but not customized just because it's customized. Customized it down to the last cell of the body of the dog so customizable that you cannot beat two of these tests that we are evolving for like almost a decade now. Um, you just cannot get more customizable, customizable solution to anything that makes you two interact on a much higher and better level. And you know what's very interesting is to see how the coach analysis results changes through the time as you apply the protocol. And then we said, because the uh, also, also, it can be like uh, we create a protocol, you take it on your own. Uh, we create a protocol and then we work together or we create a protocol and then we mentor you on that road. So it's kind of that, like a lot that, of okay. so let me ask you, let me ask you another question too, just because you, you kind of put up a little a trigger, not a bad trigger word for me, but you used kind of the word mentor and it just took my brain somewhere. Uh, how long have you been doing this for, Sasha? <laughs> So these, these customizable solutions are maybe now in place for like, let's say two years now intensively. Uh, and, but I was working on, uh, on, on this thinking of this in my mind, it was like slowly developing for almost 10 years. So when, I just didn't know. So, so once you're, once you've done a lot, I mean, and I don't know if you already have this in place, if you're already moving this direction, but, and if not, I'm sure you're still doing a lot of your research, but let's just say an example because I'm I, I'm not I'm not a big ego person I'm always open to learning um, what if I said Sasha be my Yoda can mentor me I want to do what you do do you have any mentorship programs of somebody that wants to get into someone that wants to move away from dog training? maybe I'm a dog trainer and I'm like you know what yeah I'm missing something I'd rather think of how do I get certified in, in what Sasha Reese is doing Yes, we, we, we would love to have as much as people as possible because this is what the people want. We created this out from the so big comprehensive market study of all of these, the, 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 you know, Gen Z and millennials are the majority of our uh, doggy parents at the moment, very conscious, very, uh, very aware of the world around us and very aware of the respect of the world should have and not everything should be watched through our lenses. And that's why all of these two tests are coming in before we do the protocols and recommendations. But because we need more people to mentor people, we are, I'm just limited to as much as I can do personally with my assistants and the people we have in the company, but we do want to get this out and, and help people learn about this because the tests are done. We are created all, we created all of this comprehensive, like a, amazingly humongous uh, you know um, uh, software that actually comes out and um, we are still filling up with the with the algorithm developing uh, but it's also a lot of done uh, manually the other side is done by ai we are uh, i i i a or how you AI. call those so so, yeah. so as a student so so, so i do need we, yeah we do need this world do need more uh, pure love and harmony certified uh, Mentors okay. for the people. To so you have, do you have a school for that already yet? Or is it right now? No. Because I'm working with clients only right now. No, I'm only working for, because my idea is actually to turn clients into a mentors because they know it the best. And they've, been, and they've already been through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's our next stage because I'm thinking everyone that loves what I'm telling should go through the program themselves with their own dog. Make your, make two tests. Let, let us do the comprehensive analysis come and join us for a couple of months, see the difference that we'll create for your own yard, because that would be the best way you can advocate for this philosophy. Oh, well, I mean, I guess it's like anything, you know, like I've, I've been taking this protein shake for working out and I haven't gotten results. And now that I'm using this protein shake, now I'm a distributor because I've been using it and it works. And now I want to share yeah. it to people, right? Okay. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So that is how, that is where we are at the moment. And that is what I, I if you go to the myplh.com, then you're going to see uh, why I want, wanted to say this is actually, that was a long down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I think we're going to do, we're going to do that a lot, whenever we talk. <laughs> yeah. When you said, when you said about uh, how the, how the dog, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't walk in the nature, if they do not mi migrate for the food, protect the territory or demand the territory. 
And then we are doing one very interesting study now. If you go to our institute, you'll see two studies. One is a behavioral study I was just telling about going deeper in the next phase and next level. But also I'm, uh, we are doing with our research team on, on field in India, uh, in Hyderabad, India. I'm, uh, we are working and conducting a study about uh, how the dogs can be a vegetarian by choice. Because in India, you have a lot of villages that are actually vegetarian by generations. And the dogs that live in those villages doesn't eat anything, just the leftovers from the food that's out there on the street that are only veggies and the fruits and maybe some paneer or old and dirty milk. But that's, that's, a, that's a side. That's maybe another topic. Are the, can the dogs be vegetarian? We can talk about that some, some yeah, other time. Yeah, because I can tell. Because uh, I have already questions about that and my own theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that that's going to just... We're going to talk another hour just on that. But yeah, yeah, but it might be interesting because we are just the way we, we, get, we get a lot of uh, insights already from the field, but and we need to analyze the data in order to publish that, uh, that, that paper. But on the other side, uh, what, what, what we observe there is when you have a dog that's free, no owner, nothing, they're just on the street, leisure time, doing their business, minding their own job. As you said, the dogs that are walking across the street when the cars are not running around, right? That, that we thought last time, you're going to see those dogs laying down and sleep. If they do not go to eat, look for the different sources of the food, mark or protect the territory. And you're going to see if the, if, uh, if you, you're going to see them in urban areas, the dog would not walk more than one block away just to see that all is okay. No one is hunting yeah, like us. Rules. They establish their territory, their neighborhood, and they don't go out beyond that. And where is the territory? where the food is yeah. so if the source of the food is in this house in front of me why would i go far away to exercise to burn more calories because i was just eating or drinking last night this concept of the exercise it's not a natural concept because you know if you go and you learn physics or anyone that learned physics learned about the second thermodynamic law that it says you need to achieve and the entire entire universe operates on that law. It's a, achieve the maximum results for the minimum energy used, so you don't lose energy. And what do we do? We 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 don't use. We don't fly on the edge of the, because we overeat, and then we exercise. So the first thing in order to get exercise out from your way is stop overeating. Don't overeat because if you overeat, much more energy is needed to process, then you need to run to lose the calories. Then we need to do all other things to distract a life by doing things that was caused by something that shouldn't happen on first place. So the dogs doesn't have that concept in their mind. If they don't need to do something, they wouldn't do it. If they don't really need to do it, they would, they choose not to do it. So the concept of exercise and long and muscles and this, you will see Chihuahua, that's this tiny, has lived in an apartment that's 500 square feet, has a muscles like a greyhound that runs like fields over and over and over. And this Chihuahua isn't like a home and doesn't go more from the toilet back to her little bed to sleep. You know, something interesting too, um, and I'd love to, to get a little bit of your insight on this. So um, as you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I have a lot of clients in Orange County, in California, you know, around the world but I live in North Carolina <clears throat> and the dogs and animals in North Carolina, especially where the part where I live is much different than when I go to like the, the city in Orange County or I go to maybe a, a city in Florida. But I guess home is where the heart is, like you were just saying, but a lot of my neighbors, their dogs are not in a fence line. Their dogs can come and go from their house as a matter of fact, like one of my neighbors, when he lets his dog go pee, he just opens the door because the dog has to get let out. And his dog just goes around the property. There's no fence. He never leaves. Mm. He doesn't go three neighborhoods down. Um, he sees other dogs. So other people are walking the dogs. His dog doesn't run off the property. Um, it's, they're like ranch dogs. They're just, they're free roaming, but they don't go anywhere. They don't bother anybody. But yet, if you're in a city and your dog leaves your house, they get lost. They don't even know how to get back home. Mm. Right. Um, so I, I think a lot of that is kind of what you're mentioning about, uh, well, the bond and the, the food and where, and like you said, where's the food, 
right? Like you were saying, they're going to stay localized to where the food is. Yeah. Right. Where, but a lot of those typical dogs are so excited, the bond is not there that they, it's almost like they have to earn their freedom. So they go out, they get excited, and then once they're done with their excitement, they're like, wait, where am I? <laughs> yeah. And then usually, as I said, like uh, when you see like what excitement actually need, uh, means, and uh, you, there, there is one study um, that, that was published I think, in 2018, and it's like ongoing study. They said like that overexcitement, what we see as an overexcitement, and we see my dog is happy, my dog loving me so much, follows me all over the place. He cannot stay still. He just, uh, wherever I go, he follows me. He want to be with me in the bathroom and things like that. And there is a study showing that the dogs that follow their people around, their human people around, um, they're actually uh, so much in stress that their, 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 their body develops, uh, is in a chance of developing uh, some sort of cancer over 85%, uh, 68% than average dog that doesn't follow their, their owners around. And that's where, we, again, we are coming back to the point of hyper... So, 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 and, and I just want to make sure that I'm understanding and I'm not misunderstanding. So are you saying that, that an overexcited dog, a dog that's excited all the time, I was, as we might perceive it as my dog's happy, yeah. Th yeah. that could cause dysfunction in the body where they can get sick easier. Yep, because that's exactly what this study shows. And on that study, we developed this uh, 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 canine wellness, uh, wellness, uh, canine harmony wellness test. On that study, I understood actually that that's where this goes, that the human perception is actually not enough for people to understand that by de doing this to the dogs, they are actually ruining the life of the dog out from the pure love and this uh, 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 the, how say, misinterpretation of their behavior. But when you get a lab test that shows you that the ratio of the calcium and magnesium, activity of your thyroid gland, hyperactivity of your adrenaline gland, everything that we perceived as a, perceived as a happy, healthy dog is actually the dog in a constant panic and a constant stress and a high glucose level and the low immune system and the brain that is constantly alert and the body that is constantly fighting and functioning and trying to protect and cannot sleep a single second you know you you you, you bring up when i talk to you man when i talk to you you get me excited about about working with animals a lot more it's, it's so fun to go back and forth with you but and you also bring up old memories that my mentor used to talk about that i don't i don't remember and then when i talk to you i'm like oh, that's exactly what my mentor used to say stuff like this but one of the things that my mentor was talking about because with him i was asking my mentor once i said hey why don't we use treats? Like, why are we not using food with the training? Because the dogs like it. Um, they want to get paid. I mean, you want to get paid, right? And they're so excited and happy with the food. They look like they're happy and they want to perform for you. And one of the things he said was, I said, well, Tony, um, what do you like about your wife? And I said, I mean, we have a great relationship. We have a long common. He goes, what are some nice things she does for you? I say, um, she remembers, you know, she remembers special moments in my life, special dates. She's made me some awesome meals. Um, she's, 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 she's brought me notes at work before. She's dropped things off for me. I mean, we just have an amazing relationship. And he goes, oh, okay. Well, I, I'm curious, how much do you pay her? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't pay her because that's right. Because it's not a business employee relationship, is it? Yeah. It's a symbiotic relationship. But he also said the reason why food is not good to use in training is because you're using food because it's an instinct of survival for the dog. That's why people use food. That's I what you're using yeah. for him, and it gets them stimulated. But what he says, what you're doing is you keep them in a primitive state. And when you keep them in a primitive state, it's constant excitability and anxiety. And they're constantly waiting for that next primitive state. He said, when wolves eat, they go into a primitive state when they hunt and then they all eat the carcass, but then it's over. They're yeah. not in the primitive state all day long, but Just, when you're feeding them all day with treats to do things, you keep them in a primitive state all day long and that's not natural. That's amazing uh, perception. And look at now, you, you touched again an amazing point there. Uh, observe the wolf hunt and the body language of the wolf when they are killing the prey. They look excited. 
and they look how your excited dog looks when you come home. And then you look how, which kind of excitement we bring out from the dogs when we play with them. And then you see why, and you think that it's so easy just to kill a prey, just like that. I go hit hunt, left, right, blah, blah, blah. You need to be having your body so high up in adrenaline and the cortisol that you black out and you don't see nothing just that prey that might help you survive tomorrow and for your for your for your little uh, for your so that's where we oftentimes take our dogs to all the time all the time all the time to that blackout of the hyperactivity and excitement that's killing themselves from within and that's why i think bringing in the lab analysis to explain to the people black and white it's not because it's i said so is because if you see this and this with that and that and this and this and this is how we're going to change that let's do the protocol and in three months you see this and that this and that this and this and you just move on and, and so yeah so and then i mean so if you're if you can't and so anyway <laughs> using food man you're 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 getting me so excited i can't talk today Using food keeps them in a primitive state, which, which that's not good to have them in that primitive state. And then every time they look to you, you represent that. Mm -hmm. So when they see you, now they get excited. And that's not how, and by the way, they're not excited because they see you, it's what you represent. All the yes. food, right? Um, and then if you're not gonna use food and you use correction, that's a different stimulation. That's, that's a avoiding uh, mistakes, avoiding fear stimulation. So I, Either one of those is causing constant stimulation and then your dogs get sick much faster. They, they don't live as long. Um, and and that's, that's where we need to learn to play with the dogs. So what, what means content and happy dog means dog that might look like a boring dog. Then when you play with your dog, he, as I said, purr, purrs like a cat. He fell asleep on the end of the game. And he just, you just leave the dog there and he just lays for sleep. And that's what's actually bring healing to the dog. When I said like, we need to find something that you need to do to your dog and to doing that, and we look for every single protocol, every single dog is different based on the relationship they have with the dogs. You have a people personality because this canine human um, um, uh, pro, uh, test that we do as well, like a uh, uh, dynamic test mm -hmm. is also, uh, consider it takes in con pretty much in consideration a human personality and the human mood so the part of the test has to do with analyzing who you really are not pretending to be because you cannot cheat the test the test is done in a way that you answering the questions really reveal a lot about you and uh, all of that is actually not not to uh, kind of question or to judge or not it's very unjudgmental um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, diving into relationship the aim of that is just to do an assessment so the protocols might come best for you your personality because you might not be good to play the same way i play because of the test results wouldn't uh, recommending the same but on the end when you come to the point of uh, exactly what you would do and how to bring the dog to this calmness level and what to perform with the dogs in order to do something to a dog that will make him sleep and they let you do that for as much as you want. And then all, when the dog lets, when you interact with the dog and your dog falls asleep while you are doing it, that's still a play. You're still in interaction. But can you imagine a, life, a level of the trust your dog has in you and which kind of bond you to have in order for him to let you do that? Mm. And that's where actually the healing happens because exactly as we hype them up and do this and do that and raise the cortisol and everything up, it's not raising. That's why a lot of injuries are happening within the playtime because it's not only a playtime, it's a power challenge if we do it that way. And then how to, how to reverse that and instead of raising all of those hype, hype, hyper um, uh, um, um, hormones we need in order to achieve that, uh, that uh, behavior, or that, uh, that those actions, we calm everything down. And in that calming down, it might look from the outside very boring, but it's a high end of the dog trust that develops so at you, that point. How do you respond to people that, because I mean, 
I know that you'll agree with me in this, but it's very common to see excited dogs. And people, people take joy in seeing their dogs overexcited. <clears throat> For whatever reason, humans like to see overexcited dogs. They look happy. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you respond to somebody that says, Sasha, I see your dogs and your dogs look sad? Mm. Can you can you can you just put because we tr we tend to humanize everything. Let's 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 humanize this situation. Okay. How would you feel if your children would behave the same way as you would love to see your dogs behave overexcited? I tell them to sit down and be freaking still or put Dora the Explorer on. Would you, <laughs> your, how would you behave if you see your mother doing that to you every single time when you come to her home for a lunch? How would you see if the horse would act and interact with us on that oh, level. Oh, I mean, an excited horse is a dangerous horse. There you go. Yeah. So why we think that anything different would be with the dogs? It's just, it's that what we miss. For, and now, now we are touching the harmony and orders of love and the family constellation. It's what do I miss from my childhood that the dogs can bring a memory form. And now when I come home, someone is so much in love with me that they jump so high and they are happy. They're not happy. What they're looking is a you know, source of injuries. Are you okay? Did you came back from the danger world? So they need to touch you. Yeah. They need to smell you. Or smell where you've been at. Yeah. Oh, looks like you froze. They need to see you. And all of those things that the dogs are that, that the dogs are doing at that time are very stressful for them, because you know that injured dog, injured wolf is never coming back to pack. Yeah. No. And you know why? 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 He, he would be killed. Yeah, because he's weak. He's weak, and even if it's alpha, they don't come back to the pack. And why do you think the dogs are jumping so high? Every single time, it's, every single time when the dogs are coming home, when the wolves are coming back from the from the hunt and from the prey or whatever, from the outside world back to the cave, the one thing the rest of the pack want to be sure, nothing happened to them. Mm -hmm. Because if something happened to them, entire pack might be in danger. The first thing they need to do is to kill the one that came home injured because now he he may be directing the entire threat of the some, some other wolf uh, whatever back to our home so that's not to and that's that that you learn when you uh, independently and honestly observe um, like uh, wolf behavior pack behavior group dynamic the wolf injured wolf goes away from pack and die on its own he doesn't bring home uh, his misery right, and his right. uh, he, because he cannot protect the group anymore and he doesn't come home and you um, and then when you learn that about the dogs and you understand that group mentality for example also uh, we think when the uh, this um, uh, how you say that um, um, can you can I just uh, take a time off just to uh, tell my husband to do something uh, sure. and then I'll come back one second I have a yeah, consultation yeah, yeah, yeah. I just need to push a little back sure. please sure Stay there. okay so while sasha is going to, to kind of push throughout his next appointment just want to let you guys know this is an awesome awesome conversation we're going so much deeper than we do normally and we're already kind of like an hour and a half in so um we won't go much longer but um it's really hard to to um to keep things within an hour when you're really getting into deep, deep diving into dog psychology and behavior and, and uh, uh, animal ownership. So, I'm sorry. Uh, so Sasha, I just wanted to let you know too, you know, we, um, I, I know that we could talk forever and, and I know that we're having a lot of fun here. So we can continue. I have another 30 minutes, but if you have to go, you just let me know that you have to go. I have to go in 30 minutes anyway, but. I, I do have to go, but we can wrap this up. I just wanted to finish my thoughts. Um, you know, when the, we have this uh, common belief that when the how, how you, separation anxiety, mm -hmm. okay? Separation anxiety happens because my dogs misses me. Mm -hmm. And my dogs wants me to be with me and 
he cannot stay home with, without me and things like that. Mm. What actually happens in the dog's mind is that they are not having a so-called secure attachment with us and they don't trust that we can survive the dangerous world without them being present by our side. Mm. And they think that we are so dumb that we cannot even find a way home to our cave so because of that, they need to pee and poo all over the place to leave the smell so we can navigate back home. And that's when they, when that's they do that. That I find me. I just <laughs> don't put my pink shoes on. You're just, just right out of the house. Right. That's, <laughs> that, that's, how, that's, that's what you learn when you observe the group dynamic of the wolf interaction in between themselves. And as well, I had a lot of... Um, uh, blessings that I was able to observe um, group dynamic of the dog's behavior on the on the uh, like a dogs that are living without uh, like a stray dogs if I can say so urban dogs in uh, Mexico and in in, uh, in Brazil in Bulgaria Albania Serbia so I was on these little uh, expeditions through our institution and my myself just the dive into that like how the dogs interact themselves when there are no people so to learn like what the basic instinct of the dog when the group dynamic is in place because we are not the pack the pack is strict definition of the pack is a family it must be a mother and the father with a different generation of the offspring and siblings in indeed so it's a family but the dog tends to create a group among themselves that are not family but some dynamic need to be as well uh, present there so uh, when the when the dogs are when when we go out from the cave from the secure place and close the door what actually happens is the dog feels that their mom they are uh, and now you put yourself in the shoes and follow what i say right. so the dogs are thinking that we are their babies and they are our parents mm -hmm. the way we behave why the way we behave we are too emotional towards them and they don't feel that that emotional state of ours is enough to protect the group. So they, they must think, these are infants, so I need to protect them. So when Especially the, when we the, over vocalize in a high pitched voice, so we sound like we're always, because when, when puppies whine a lot, it's because they're calling attention to themselves. And we do that to our dogs, not realizing, hi, hi, all hi, the time. so much are you doing? All as far the as they're concerned, we're bringing attention to ourselves. It's not yeah, necessarily and, affection. And now there is a mom, that is a dog in their little mind. Mom is left home. Yeah. And the infant child, like let's say one, two years child, went out and locked the door. And now outside is a dangerous world. And now so how the child of two years old will survive outside if the mom is locked inside the home? Because I'm a parent and I actually can put myself in those shoes. I would chew the place upside down. I don't know what I would do in order to get myself out to go after and run after my child to not to get hit by the car. Yeah, nothing so can, you imagine, from your kid. Yeah. can you imagine how how amazing stress that might be for your dog and why is that only because insecure attachment is present in between two of us two, two of us and the dog doesn't trust i can survive on my own without them being present because they have in their mind i'm an infant like an owner and they're the ones that are older they are ones that are responsible and they are the ones that need to protect me and that's where the that's where the anxiety separation anxiety it's a separation anxiety but because they think that we are their babies and that they're responsible for our life and if we are not together they cannot protect us even though it's nothing to do with the logic and with the truth and we we provide tomorrow food and we will this is our house we pay the mortgage and we're going to come back from the from the job anyhow but the way we communicate with them our body language our emotional state our mood, our life doesn't prove us right. So Sasha, um, I, I'm, I, I, hang, I, mean, I feel like I need to hang on to you. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to please, let you go. I, I please, imagine anybody that talks to you doesn't want to let you go. <laughs> Can I ask you one more question or do you have to go? If you have to go, I'm totally okay with it. I do have to go. 
Go, but you can ask me a question. Okay. <laughs> what is your what is your um what is your opinion on dog toys? As far as like a lot of my clients they have dog toys everywhere to entertain themselves. Do you have an opinion on dog toys? I do, because we always tend to um replace the ritual and we think that the toy can be replacement for the human and or uh, when we have a toy in any game uh you always get some fight with other dogs the jealousy comes out who the power start power cha power challenge starts but uh, and then you we, the first thing when what happens when we start doing rituals is the first thing that people are supposed to do is clean the house from toys Mm. And they would say, can I, can I donate them somewhere? I said, if you want to hurt someone, donate the dog, donate toys to them. If you want, I, I'll donate it to the shelter. But why would you donate it to the shelter? It's hurting human dog interaction because you think that some toy can replace you. And where do we get those things? Also from the human, human to human interaction. We also oftentimes tense that the child that plays with a toy can express and build their creativity by building this fairy tale of interacting with a doll and with a toy and things like that. Actually losing a lot from interaction with the parents mm -hmm. because we should always understand that the most, what we can take from uh, inspiring our dogs as well as our children is to really interact with them. With them, the dog needs us, not the toys to replace us. And that's where we actually oftentimes, I, I don't have a good toy, toy, toy strategy. I'm sorry for every toy manufacturer, but I kind of- We'll, we'll, put, the, we'll put the dog think... toy industry out of business. Sorry? Then, huh? We'll put the dog toy industry out of business. I, I would really love you to invest your money somewhere where it, can, where it can really benefit the society and benefit the human dog interaction and relationship turn that money into something that's good for the dog because the dogs, the dog toys, like a dog dry food, I, get, I can say so, it's a good business. It's for sale, but it's not to be bought. It's not to buy. So you can, you can go to the, if you, if you take out the food and if you take out the toys from every single pet shop, there is no business. All right. Well, Sasha, for the people that have been working with trainers, because you know, you know, as I know, when you work with a trainer, eventually you work with another trainer and it's almost like bar hopping, but you start trainer hopping. You hop from trainer to trainer to trainer to trainer. And really it's all either some form of positive, some sort of correction or, or a balance between the both. Tired of, tired of going that direction. How do we get a hold of you? Work, or, uh, just one more time. What's the best way to get a hold of you so we can go down that rabbit hole and just stop going to PetSmart for training? So it's a pureloveandharmony.com, pureloveandharmony.com. Or actually there is my phone, 786-553-6720. That's uh, my husband's phone and everyone is just welcome to schedule a consultation. Those are free, like scheduling calls. And then I can- So, I so, can so, so the first, uh, first consultation is free? Yeah, and it's free. And then how long is that I can, consultation for usually? I don't know. It's kind of if we schedule it for fifteen minutes, but I go, I go uh, until I and we, until we can talk, because until I I I uh, until I really know, uh, I I have them sometimes scheduled for the fifteen minutes. Sometimes is enough, mm -hmm. but sometimes I I talk like for an hour. I don't have enough problem um, understanding the people's need and then really, uh, you know, presenting what we can to, what we can offer and trying to find a way, uh, to, because oftentimes the people would come telling their stories and I, I'm very empathic, empathic towards people's, uh, stories because I, I, I do understand an emotional side of, uh, living with dogs and, uh, because I'm, I'm, the dogs saved my life. So I think every single one of us in this field and that lives with the dogs might share some, some other, uh, some other story as well. That's also will be, you know, with the same roots, but the dogs would be, but that's, that's how everything initiates with this initial yeah. call. I think somebody asked, they want, um, they want the contact info one more time. So 786-553-6720. Or it's a pureloveandharmony.com. Pureloveandharmony.com. Okay. And this will be on recording, everybody. So as soon as we're done, it'll be recording. And for those that missed the beginning, you're gonna 
It's gonna be so much information. You probably already gonna be certified just watching this, <laughs> this recording. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, Sasha, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's always a great My conversation pleasure. with you. Um, and I'd love to do more things with you in the future as well. Um, because I think you and I, uh, we mesh well. Um, and I, I think we could um, really, really get the dogs what they need. Um, and also what the owners need as well, because I think that the dog training industry isn't fulfilling the needs of the dog or the owners. Because um, when you go on Facebook groups, you see reactive dog groups, and there's so many people that have a reactive dog or a behavioral issue that they're living with their whole life. Despite yeah, how many trainers they've hired, it's just not helping. Yeah, that's, you know, when I, when I get to my holistic, uh, holistic doctor or holistic vet, no matter who you talk to, this... Um, Neuro, uh, naturopathist, you know, they said like, uh, you don't agree to the food allergy. You say that you have an allergy on a chicken or allergy on a food or any kind. You find a way to boost your body, to awaken itself and get back to a memory where it was whole and compact. You never agree to your diagnose because you just uh, need to put back your system in order to become again uh, great, acceptable to everything. And that's why these people, oh, my dog is reactive. No, it's not, a rea it's reactive because that's the way they react on the surrounding you created around them. Change the surrounding by yourself and the dog gonna stop being reactive. It's so easy. It's so easy, actually. <laughs> it's yeah, so easy. That's part of the dog training. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, Sasha, thank you again so much. And thank you everybody else for, for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll do more live feeds like this in the future. And if you guys have any questions, you can contact either me or you can contact Sasha. And um, everybody have a happy time training your dogs. And most importantly, love your dogs right now. Just hang out with them and stop focusing so much on getting them to do something and just be with them. And let them realize that you, you, you respect them, you respect their dignity, and, and you love them. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Sasha. Thank you so much. And then uh, talk to you All soon. Right. Have a wonderful Bye. day. Bye.